Hi guys, welcome to the Coaching Corner. It is myself, we have Harry on here, and we have Mike as well. Say hi guys. Hey guys, what's up? Hey guys. So, I don't know if we do these frequently enough or if people tune into random episodes, so I am going to introduce Harry Smith, is one of the coaches on the team, uh, and Mike is our physio, uh, so our in-house physio, so if any of our athletes are injured, he is our go-to guy. Mike is also a bodybuilder, so that makes it really, really handy. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be discussing a really interesting topic today, and it was actually suggested by Jess, another one of our coaches, and that is kind of uh, kind of mental health and also body dysmorphia. I think both of those subjects are becoming more and less, uh, sorry, less and less taboo, but I think for men, probably both of them are a little bit more taboo uh, than some people think about. Uh, because I think for women, they maybe came to the forefront more. I won't suggest that I'm educated particularly to a high level in either subject. Maybe you guys have more uh, kind of education on that. But we're all, we're, we're all men here. We all kind of have these thoughts and feelings. And myself and Harry obviously coach uh, a lot of men as well. So we have these feelings. And I think what we'll probably discuss here isn't kind of black and white. Females can't relate to anything we're saying here. I think there'd be a lot of what females can relate to as well. But we're guys here, so we're probably more so talking from our experience. And uh, I don't know if, Mike, you want to start with kind of, I don't know, what when you think about mental health for yourself, what, what do you think about? Um, it's very interesting because I think it personally, um, <clears throat> I very much, when I think of mental health, I think of um, body perception. I think of um, how our value in the world, I think of comparison, how we compare ourselves to others. And I think that is a major driver for a lot of the mental health issues uh, we all face, especially now, you know, with social media, it's so easy to compare yourself, uh, you know, between yourself and someone else where the context is completely different and you don't have that context. So I think that that's huge. Um, and we don't, we haven't necessarily done the inner reflective work to define what success means for us. Um, but then if I was actually to take a step back and um, step out of my sort of personal view of it, I think there's a lot of connections with, you know, I've, I've seen situations of, um, you know, uh, bulimia, kind of atypical eating disorders. Um, and then also, obviously, we talked about um, Red S and the, the female athlete triad, but also how that affects men as well. So I think you've got all of those components which kind of manifest themselves together. Yeah. No, I definitely see that, especially like social media can be such a double-edged sword because I think it can be really, really beneficial for people, but it's kind of watching what you consume and how you consume it, uh, which I think is it's so easy to go down the rabbit hole of you look in your search feed and you just see all these amazing physiques. And it's just like, why am I not there yet? Uh, kind of why haven't I got mm. this? And then you just end up thinking you're no good. Uh, and for body dysmorphia, then like I, I know I've worked with people or even like had consultations you probably had this harry where mm. you're talking to someone and they're like oh like i'm not in very good shape and like I, I think i should be more advanced than i am and then you're like okay cool and then you kind of you don't know how they look through yeah. the consultation and they send their photos over and you're like dude F <laughs> fmi of 35 and you're like what are you yeah. on about <laughs> you're you're jacked so yeah. yeah i don't know if harry do you, do you your thoughts of like mental health align with kind of where mike's coming from yeah, I, I completely echo what Mike's saying. Um, I've worked with quite a few guys. I tend to get a slightly different um, client offline that I do online with Revive. I'd say the offline guys are much more the beginning of their journey. And just, just talking to them about the types of people that they follow online versus the types of people that say the uh, like our typical client would follow online is totally different. Like um, I don't really want to say any names in case I'm like accidentally slandering people, but I would just say like YouTubers who are in incredible shape all year round, really, really tanned and seem to care about partying more than training, yet they still look amazing. And it tends to be like those kind of physiques which they're comparing themselves to. And then when I have these conversations with these clients where I'm like, so do you think that this guy has an attainable physique? And they're like, yeah. And then you know in that like for us that like blows our mind and you're like, and then I try and show them some really high level natural bodybuilders and then compare the really high level natural bodybuilders to like their favorite YouTuber. And you can see that their favorite YouTuber has got like 15 kilos of lean mass on like a world champion natural bodybuilder. And you're trying to like explain, you know, the, the kind of cognitive dissonance there. I'm like, this is someone who has devoted their entire life, like every part of their life to being the absolute 
best they can be in terms of the most muscular they can be and the leanest they can be. And then here is someone who claims that they don't take training that seriously and they go to Ibiza like five times a year, yet this person has a better physique than this person. I'm like, are you seeing that there's a missing ingredient here that's not being spoken about? And then they're always like, so you're telling me that they're not natural? I'm like, well, probably not. Like, let's look at the the kind of the evidence we have. And it just blows my mind sometimes that like, and it's social media's fault that they, they, it kind of presents or people present a physique and they deliberately don't mention, uh, again, it's up to them whether they mention it or not, but let's say that it's, it's clear to someone like us, at least from what we can see that we would bet money on them, say not being natural. Yet this is a physique that many guys are comparing themselves to and feel is attainable. And like you said, they then feel bad about their own physiques and they start to feel a little bit worthless because they feel like they're putting in so much effort and, and kind of redesigning their entire lifestyle to try and attain a physique, which is just, isn't attainable for them without the right like pharmacology basically and that is definitely something that i have found messes with a lot of my clients heads like the younger guys especially and it, i find it with myself too like even now mm. like you have to be careful who you follow and have to do regular audits because some even some people who you follow for their say creativity and uh like you follow for their personality not necessarily their physique but then you find yourself at still comparing your physique sometimes where you're like oh damn i just wish i could be shredded all year round and then you're like actually no do do i want that like do I, do I want the uh, the restriction that comes with that? And I definitely find I need to reality check myself quite frequently. And lockdown hasn't made it any easier, to be honest. I think that had a big influence on on it for a lot of guys because a lot of people had nothing to do but scroll mm. on social media all the time. Uh, I feel like I'm just rambling now, so I'll throw it back to you, Steve. No, sorry, go on, Mike. I, I guess, if, if I may, that, that really brought up three kind of big sort of questions and, and kind of topics in my head. And I think um, one, the first is around you know, what is our, your definition of success? What is that person's definition of success? Because one person's definition of success, say someone that you might see on social media, their life's goal could be Mr. Olympia. Like, so, you know, Jared Feather, you know, he, his goal is to be on the Olympia stage. But if you take a, maybe one of our clients, they've got a family, that their, their success could be totally different. And so those different comparisons of success are completely separate and I uh, then that I feel is where some of that kind of um uh, kind of mental health issues comes in and then secondly the second point was around identity we all like I think so many of us attach our identity to maybe how we look and that is really dangerous particularly when it's our sole identity because you see this in sport you see people who say right who are you and they go I'm a football player then when they retire or they get injured massive depression, massive kind of mental health issues. And it's because all they've done is they've attached their sole identity to that. And I think that's where we fall into trouble. We say, oh, I'm only valuable because of how I look, very dangerous. And then that brings me on to the third point, which is about your values. You know, if your value is, you know, health, fitness or whatever, then brilliant, your physique can be a part of that. But if your values are like being with your family, you know, quality time, being a good person, then actually, you know, whether you've got a six pack or not probably means very little at the end of the day. So I think those are kind of really key things that people don't really reflect on enough. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I think that was a great kind of, yeah, three points. And one of the, the thing I was thinking when Harry was talking, when you were talking there, Mike is like realistic expectations. Mm. I think people really don't realize what's necessarily involved and also what they can achieve. It's kind of what you're saying that no one knows the context behind that person and what they've had to, quote unquote sacrifice or do rather to get there i think it's often at least in our space spoken about like people see people shredded to stage i've certainly had clients who want to get like stage shredded but they don't want to compete and i'm just like why like do you, do you think kind of having striated glutes is going to bring you happiness because it will not it will make you an angry and not a happy mofo so like people just need to realize that it's social media is like that highlight reel uh, they're posting these shredded physiques and they look fantastic and they are making out potentially that they feel great or they're just not talking about the negatives that are involved and i know myself like i'm put myself out there on social media and i would say i try and keep it on a level but i certainly don't always talk about like the struggles maybe mentally i'm going through or like the bad times the hardships because especially when you're a competitor you almost want to remove those from your mind because every time you kind of focus on something being hard, it makes it feel harder. So you try and kind of not focus on that. And so I've definitely had kind of people who want to compete 
and they see it as like a, I don't know that maybe they're a personal trainer and they're like oh yeah it's another qualification almost to step on stage because like, that's what personal trainers eventually do and I'm like but do you really know what's involved have you looked into it? have you any read any studies of kind of the hormonal disruption and kind of the, the food focus and kind of that area and what impact that could have on your life and if if you haven't you need to realize that that, that could be really hard so yeah, I think it's it's important to realize those things. But importantly, um, something you mentioned there, Mike, is something I really struggle to be good at, and that is uh, my like identity. Um, for me personally, like I do see myself quite a lot as like Steve, bodybuilder, kind of online coach, and I identify a lot with that. And I think part of that is because I spend so much time doing it. I spend so much time like coaching other people in the gym kind of listening to podcasts like my whole life like a lot of my life rather not my whole life is centered around that and I certainly sometimes feel like I am not as good a brother as I could be uh, as a boyfriend as I could be as a friend as I could be and I try and sometimes it, it's, a, it's a difficult balance I find sometimes where I really want to invest into a particular goal also I want to give time to other things and I sometimes I think I'm I've got better at it over time but I'm not as flexible as I could be so even little things where like I, I try and fit like holidays and trips with deload periods. I think that's a really effective, great approach from my like, bodybuilder mind. But also I wish I could be as flexible to understand that doing that at any time would be fine. And maybe sometimes you have to kind of meet in the middle with someone because they can't build their life around your life. That's definitely something I struggle with. And I think that is a mental barrier as well. But I, I need to get more, I, again, I've got more comfortable with it. It's something I definitely struggle with. Don't know if you guys have any particular struggles I, I can definitely relate to what you were saying about the flexibility something I struggled with a lot when I was younger particularly a levels is like especially when I started going to the gym like gym was everything like if like I, I worked for Waitrose as well and you know if Waitrose called up and said oh can you do some overtime for us I was like no no and I, I wouldn't even say why I'd just be like you know in my head I'd be like no I'm training then you know I've got my meals now you know it's like it's so inflexible. I look back and I think, Mike, you absolute numpty kind of thing. Um, and I think, and that is something which I think the, you know, time is, is so good because I think if you, you learn, the more you learn, the more experience that you get, you, it, again, it provides context. You think, and actually, you know, I am being a bit stupid. You know, if I, if I get like the 95% or, or the 90% done, then actually everything else takes care of itself. And you, you learn to become more flexible and, you know, through trial and error, you just, you learn and you think, oh, I know, actually, you know, this is, this is fine. So, yeah. How about you, Harry? Um, I, I struggle with the identity stuff that you mentioned, Steve, because um, a big part of my identity is similar to yours in the sense that like uh, I'm an online, <clears throat> I'm, can't speak, I'm an online coach for Revive Stronger, which is a company that I obviously uh, looked up to for a, for a number of years before I was, the the crazy situation which led to me being able to join the team in the first place so i definitely struggle with um that side of things like feeling like there's like a a big um like a like almost like a, a super role that i have to kind of fill and that creates a lot of pressure in, in its in its own self and then there's the other side like um i've been a personal trainer for years and i've always felt like there's a pressure to look like a personal trainer whatever that is and, and that is something that's perpetuated a lot by family and friends too. You know, like uh, the comments that don't really mean anything. They don't bother you where say like you're at a restaurant with uh, friends or whatever. And then people like apologize for ordering a particular thing in front of you or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And you're like, what, <laughs> why would I care? Or like, if, like what I find something that always happens is if I order any kind of alcohol, I'll be ridiculed for like 15 minutes just because I'm drinking alcohol and everyone else is like, I can't believe you're doing that, blah, 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 blah. And then all that stuff is always like kind of swirling around in your head at the same time as feeling a pressure to, uh, I feel the pressure to be like super, super lean all the time to kind of live up to, you know, the social media side of things. And then I feel pressure to be super real all the time, which is to obviously not be lean all the time and be honest about like what's going on. And then generally you can just feel like, uh, like four or five different kind of pulls pulling you in different directions and you kind of almost lose yourself along the way to an extent. Like um, the lifestyle flexibility stuff is stuff that I, I wouldn't say I've, I've struggled with. If anything, I, I am too far towards the, the normal end of the spectrum because I don't have any um, friends other than like you guys at Revive that are that into training. Like even the, the trainers that I work with are like, they look at like the things I do and think it's weird 
and I would consider myself to be the, the least bodybuilding driven of all of the coaches here. If that, not to any detriment to myself, if that doesn't make any sense to you guys, like I definitely feel like I'm, I'm trying a lot to balance real life with like bodybuilding principles, like recreational bodybuilding is what I'd call it. And then, yeah, just things like, um, yeah, just like me having even a, a semblance of meal timing is, is judged a hell of a lot in like the other environments and stuff I'm with. And I definitely find it's, uh, I have to try and be less flexible not more flexible because i let the flexibility get too much of me sometimes where i'm trying to trying to do if, if it's your macros but also trying to adhere to a calorie deficit but then also trying to socialize and then also trying to do this and then before you know it you've had like three weeks where you've lost like 200 grams and you're like it would have been so much easier to just say no guys i'll go out of you in two weeks rather than like yeah i can go if uh, yeah i'm just i hope that makes sense i'm rambling now yeah and it, but that comes totally back to what we were saying about our definition of success it's you know if your kind of goals are completely different to ours why should you need to compare what what you do to to what we do and yes you know you can you can learn and if you if kind of you know you're one end of the spectrum and maybe you might if you're you know coming to kind of like a physique um prep and you know you have to be a little bit kind of a bit more disciplined then yeah you can kind of turn the dial a little bit but equally if you're in your off season then you know why do you feel you need to be someone that you're not so that's where I say the the social media influence comes in, where you do come to an off season, but then you feel uh not a pressure, but a uh like a longing to be you always feel like you want to be the thing you're not. I think that's the way the that the, this life is like. It's like when you're like peak off season, you're like, I wanna be shredded. And then when you're peak shredded, you're like, I wanna be in my off season. And it's always just the case of like the grass is greener in whichever pasture you're not in. <clears throat> yeah, I think it, it's interesting to me because I think as a coach, you will, I, I think regardless of if you think you are or not, you're a role model for your clients. You, you just mm. absolutely are. And for me, I have to remember that I'm not just a role model in terms of being consistent, doing my training, getting my nutrition in, but also sharing the other elements of like being flexible, enjoying kind of meals out with thing, people. And I think potentially some of like the blogs we've been doing over on the members site, hopefully that's giving some insights into that sort of side. I try to share it like on stories a little bit, but it's so hard to give people insights into that sort of thing. But it, yeah, it's realizing that your clients not only look up to you for your physique and for what you're doing kind of in the gym and your performance and everything, but also being real and like kind of, so they can relate to you even more so from that angle as well. And I think actually I wanted to come back to what you said there, Mike, in terms of experience. I think over time you just get way better at all of it. I think about like when I initially was tracking macros and using my fitness pal, I think we've all been there where it's like it's pretty stressful. It feels like it takes the whole day. You're like playing macro Tetris all the time and it's not a comfortable thing. Whereas you want it, you get to a stage where you actually could probably not use my fitness pal if you wanted to, or if you use it, it's nothing that's stressful. It takes like 10 minutes of your day and it's like a habit. I think a lot of the things around like nutrient timing and kind of making sure you hit your protein and that kind of get that 80% result from 20%, like the preto law type of thing. Like you get a lot from kind of the habits that you end up just building yourself. And I think that's probably what we try and do with clients. So it doesn't become such a, a mental strain and you can be more flexible, but whilst it's kind of like being flexible, but because you're so good at just hitting what you need to hit. Like I, I walk through my day and probably to someone outside looking in, like you said, the other PTs, Harry, they probably think like, what the hell? Like you're so like robotic doing all these little mm. things. But I'd like to think that like, it's just part of my day and it's kind of not to someone else. It hopefully doesn't look that strange. And that's hopefully what we try and kind of get with our clients. Um, I don't know if that really opens up into the, like the mental health thing. Cause I think for me, like I almost do periodize things so that like life can fit within that. And I think I probably sometimes have it the wrong way around where we always say like you want your tr kind of training and nutrition to complement your lifestyle. I think sometimes my lifestyle complements my training and nutrition. Um, I have it a little bit backwards and it's just finding the right mix of the two. And I think it obviously depends on everyone. Like you said there, Mike, depends on your goals. Like for me, I want to be like the best natural bodybuilder I can possibly be. And at this stage of my life, I can invest a ton into that because I have no children. I have no other commitments. But further down the line, that may well change. Um, I might decide it's not worth that investment uh, and kind of I will come to that decision when I do and I might look like I have more balance. But I think 
I think particularly probably coaches, but also people listening struggle with both ends where they feel like they're either giving too much and maybe they are, but maybe they're not giving enough and they could give more, but they're like, oh no, I should be balanced. It's such a, it's a tricky place to lie. <laughs> and like, I think again, that's kind of prompted like three ideas in my head, really. Um, like the first is what you're saying about there are cycles with everything. There are cycles through, throughout the year where we'll be working harder. So there might be a, a phase where we're all, we're working harder, you know, nose to the grindstone. But then there'll be another period in the year where things are a little bit less busy. And, you know, maybe that's the time where you go on holiday or things are just a bit low key and it's more of a recovery phase. We've got cycles throughout our life where, you know, like you said, you know, okay, this is our kind of athlete stage of our life maybe. And then there's a, another stage where, you know, okay, now we're a parent. So actually all of our time is devoted to that. And then there's another time when actually we're retired. And so we can do something completely different. And I think it's about knowing what stage in life we're at, knowing, you know, okay, what is, um, you know, what are my kind of primary goals, primary values now? And, you know, and where does that sit? And being comfortable with that and not feeling, again, we have to be someone else or we have to be, five different versions which actually let that come when it comes yeah. um and i think yeah. if i can just I, like the two final ideas was just um you mentioned about flexibility i think it's about flexibility within principles so principles are timeless uh you know they're always the same it's like you know having a good character being a good person but being flexible within that kind of frame and then like, finally, it was just what you said about role models. Just everyone is a role model, you know, as a coach, you're a role model to clients, but you know, someone else could be a role model to their younger brother, their mum. And I think it's always recognizing that someone is always watching you and trying to be, you know, and being open. So like, if you are having a bad day, be open with that because then that's someone who looks up to you can say, oh no, it's actually okay to, to have a good day. And that vulnerability, I think is where, you know, where the gold really is. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of the Revive Stronger member site. Inside you'll find a thriving forum, a growing exercise library, presentations, research reviews, and courses. If you want to get involved, sign up via the description. I think that vulnerability is what we end up hiding the most though from uh, like social media and stuff like that, isn't it? I think that's the case with all humans because we're trying to project, Not even it's not even a conscious thing. We're not consciously trying to project that um, everything is all like good and dandy it just ends up being like i like, look at it this way when like i don't know if you guys are any if any, of you, any of your partners are like my partner but for example we we go on holiday and then she wants to take photos on the beach or whatever and i will be done no matter what so i'll take one photo whether that is good bad like horrendous or amazing i don't care it's taken whereas she will want us to take about seven thousand photos until we get the one which is going <laughs> to go on social media Whereas with me, I'll be like, I'll just take it. If it didn't turn out good, I won't post it. If it turned out good, yeah, I'll post it. But I won't stick around for like an hour and a half to get that perfect photo. And I think that um, that comes down to that kind of thing, you know, how we're always trying, just trying to project the best, the best of ourselves. And uh, just for some people, it's just a little bit more of a, um, I don't know, which I don't know what it is. People like, I definitely feel there's this pressure there with females more than men with social media, like trying to present like everything looking perfect and fine and dandy. But I think with us, it's very much a case of we might not take 10,000 photos, but we just won't upload a photo if it, we don't consider it to be like one of the best ones. But Mike, I wanted to come back to something you said, like the values analysis stuff that you mentioned. Um, that's something I've never really spoken about publicly, but I do what I call a personal values analysis, probably like three or four times a year where I sit down and actually have an exercise where um, I try and identify like where I'm at in my own like headspace, what my values are now, what do I value, how much do I value it? And then it's interesting seeing, because I, I, I keep records of it as well, how much that changes, like over, not just over the years, but over the course of one year, like how, for example, like last year, I was super focused on trying to get a house and stuff like that. And then once that happens, I had a bit of an identity crisis where I was like, I've actually... I've achieved the thing I was working towards. And I think it's kind of like what your, you said your athletes are like sometimes where they, they hit the end of their athletic career and they feel totally lost and don't have any direction. And I definitely felt the same when, even though something as, pos as positive as say achieving a, a lifestyle goal I had for myself, I definitely felt lost for probably three or four months because I, I didn't do that values analysis until about three or four months after I bought the place. But then that helped me to really figure out what to focus on for like the next 
few months and stuff. And I definitely think it's an exercise that's really useful um, when you find yourself comparing yourself too much to other people. Like what we've spoken about with the mental health side of things, say you're comparing yourself to, um, let's say, a fitness model on social media. And like you said, we all have different lives and different goals. That fitness model might be someone who has the goal of becoming the most prolific fitness model in the world. Yet, you, if you were to do your own values analysis, you might realize that if you say you had, um, like I do a top 10, like value, top 10 values, not top 10, uh, top 10 values. And being a fitness model, fitness model might be number 20 on your top 10 values. So how the hell can you even compare yourself to this person where from their own values, their value, their number one value is becoming the most prolific fitness model in the world. And I definitely think that that values analysis thing, I'm not sure if you meant it in such a formal way that I do it, but um, that physical values analysis has been so good for helping me to direct my attention to where it really matters and to stop like, you know, when you find you're taking on all the information rather than just the information that matters to you. Definitely. And is that, sorry. I was going to yeah. say, is it like a, can you Google this value yeah. analysis and it's something you can yeah. find online? Cool. It's the Demartini values analysis. I think I've heard I think. of that. Yeah. For other things. But maybe. I do like my own version of it because it's a bit long winded. But once you've like, once you've done it the first time, I'd say follow the exercise. But when you're doing it for like the fifth, sixth, seventh time, you can kind of skip the bits that aren't that important. But what it does is it quantifies things in like a pie chart. So it helps you realize like exactly what you care about the most. Like you might find that like at some points in my life, like when I did the uh, photo shoot back with you, Steve, in 2017, it was like the, like two thirds of my pie chart was like my yeah. physical appearance was of, of the highest value. And that, that shocked me at the time, even though I was prepping for a photo shoot, it shocked me how much I was caring about that. And then, yeah, it's just a really interesting exercise to do because it makes you think um, about yourself objectively rather than subjectively, which I think is a hugely important factor. And it definitely helps you to like balance your mental stuff to an extent and help you decide where to focus and what to focus on and what to ignore, which I think is more important than what to focus on is what to ignore. And I think that's really, really important because I think where mental health really starts to influence us negatively is because whether if we don't decide about things like, you know, what are our values, if we basically don't, decide where we want to go in life, who we are, it gets dictated to for us, whether that's in the form of social media or someone else, because never, or life in general, it will dictate it for us. And I think that's what happens. You know, we get caught in the rat race. We get maybe caught in kind of, you know, being dictated to by other people. And then we don't spend time reflecting on those things. And then before we know it, um, you know, that that's what's happening. And we do, and you know, we're doing things that are, not part of our values and that's where i think you know the mental health challenges really do come because we do something like focus on our physique when physique has nothing to do with our values whatsoever um so yeah and that's where people get a bit stuck i think i think that's something i feel like i'm good as as a uh, kind of coach to others like i can identify how important various things are to them and i quite often i think I don't know if we attract this type of client, but a fair few of our clients, I think, or at least the people I coach, come from probably over prioritizing what they do. And um, I need to just basically like, be like, chill out or like, don't emphasize that so much. It's minutiae, it doesn't matter. And I feel like I'm good at making people focus on the bigger picture in that sense and allow them to be less stressed about like social occasions and those sort of things and uh, make them realize like, get them to focus on themselves and how far they've come versus focusing so much on other people. But I definitely find myself not just physique wise. Like I think for me personally, I don't like to think I am this, but I think I may become it where it's like, I'm a figurehead for a certain methodology. Like the way I train, if I don't get results, then the way I train is wrong, which is completely false. But then it makes me really focused on, man, I have to make sure I fucking nail everything and I do make progress, which is a double-edged sword because it fills me with anxiety, but also fills me with passion and fuel to push it. So like when I next compete, I am definitely going to have a lot of pressure on myself, not just for myself personally, because I always put pressure on myself to be the best. I can be. Also, I feel like I'm going to put pressure on myself from social media to perform a certain way. And I don't think I'm right to do that because I think really the people that truly follow revive stronger understand that there's more to competing than kind of where you place and those sort of values uh, but like even down to uh, i sometimes some watch some other podcasts and i see like i don't know 
I, I listen to them and I'm like, man, they're such a good host. I'm nowhere near as good as them. Like, why, why can't I be better? And that definitely drives like a little bit of kind of negative thoughts and feelings towards myself. And it always helps for me personally, especially with my physique, it's easy to do like checking back on old photos and comparing to where you are now or videos, like checking back at like how you used to talk. I'm sure you have this, Harry, where you probably have some old social media videos where you'd be talking to the camera and be like, you'd look now and be like, man, I'm so much better than this. I can't believe I put this video out. I definitely look back. So yeah. it comes back to that experience that you said, Mike, with all of this. I think if someone's listening and they feel like, oh my gosh, my mental health and my body dysmorphia is awful. The great thing is they've already recognized that and they're going to improve. Um, but coaching uh, is surprising how much I think a coach can actually help someone or a support network. So like even talking to you guys now is we're helping one another in uh, whichever way. Uh, it's, it's interesting how much that can help. And yeah, I've got two things um, this time. So um, I think firstly, what you mentioned there is um, another big um, sort of mousetrap really is attachment. We get attached to a lot of things that are either outside of our control or that very external. Um, so by that, I mean, we might get attached to our physique. We might get attached to our outcome. And again, when, or another example might be, we get attached to our car and that's not really in our control. We, you know, God forbid, but I could be, I could be in a car accident tomorrow and get, you know, horrendously horrendous burns. And, you know, uh, you know, that's it, you know, but if I attach, if I'm, if I haven't attached myself to that, or if I'm, if I'm going to compete soon, I'm not attaching myself to the outcome of being first. I'm attaching, oh, I'm attaching myself to, to something bigger than that, to, to being a better person, to being a better bodybuilder. And I think, again, it's more, we've got to almost detach from the external and try and attach the internal a little bit more, I think definitely feel that like um i hurt my wrist in lockdown and uh, i needed to wear a sling for about two weeks and then i am someone who i thought i didn't consider my physique or training a huge part of my identity obviously it is but i thought i was someone who was quite flexible in their own identity and having that experience where i couldn't train properly or the way i wanted to for about two to four weeks it was really eye-opening because it made me realize like you said mike like, how much i was attached to training as a part of my identity and it did, I did have a, not an identity crisis by any means, but I definitely had like an identity analysis back then where I was thinking like, um, I didn't realize how much it would affect me, the ability to not be able to train, especially because you can take training for granted and stuff like that. And the gym's closing and lockdown is the perfect example of that, where people don't realize how much of their identity is external, like you said, until gyms closed. And then it was just a really tough time for so many people. I'm very lucky that I had the garage gym that I had, but my small experience of that was like hurting my wrist and then not being able to train. And then finding that whole, that mindset was creeping in where, because I couldn't train the way I wanted to, I could hear that voice saying, just don't train then, which obviously I didn't let happen. I still continue to train, but I could, I could feel, you know, that, that voice was like, well, what's the point in it all if I can't do it the way I want to do it. And that's where it brings us back to that whole importance of flexibility and how, losing the rigidity is, is one of the best ways to, I guess, improve your own mental health when it comes to your identity is to allow yourself to be a bit more fluid and a bit more flexible, but understand what your principles are. And I think that's where the, the value stuff comes in. Definitely. But it does make me laugh when you see guys who are like insanely a attached to their car as their identity. That makes me laugh. Well, you know, we see like a Vauxhall Corsa with like a spoiler and stuff like that one. And you're like, oh, man, just, yeah, just makes me laugh. It's endearing, but it's like, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it, I think also it really just comes also down to control what you can control. So during lockdown, um, you know, I had a few bits of equipment. I didn't have everything to start off with. But and when when someone gets injured, I always like to say, what can you do rather than what can't you do? Because sometimes if you get an injury, like you break your leg or something, you think, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. It's like, no, 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 no. Hang on. What can you do? And it's like, okay, right, it's lockdown. I can do press ups. I can do, I've got some chairs. Okay, cool. I can do some deficit chairs, uh, deficit push ups, sorry. I can do some squats, single leg squats. And it's just, I think it's always about thinking, right, what's in my control right now? Whatever's outside of that, I'm going to let it go or I'm going to try to let it go. I'm just got to try and keep coming back to that question. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think something both of you have kind of alluded to is, getting out of your comfort zone sometimes i think sometimes we fall too far into it and I, I definitely have done that and kind of feel like i've 
almost wasted time. And I think it's like you said, what can you do? I think a lot of the time people think, oh, like if you put all that time and effort into training, nutrition or whatever, and maybe that's really important to you. So it's, it's important you do. You can't do anything else. But it's completely not true. Because when we think about like our at least methodologies with dieting, it's very inclusive. If you're in your off season in particular, like there's a lot of social things you can then go and do um, to go and enjoy those. And then it's a case of like what is there to do like okay maybe we don't go out partying but maybe we suggest to do something else um and something i've i recently listened to i can't remember the actual podcast it was referred to me by james walsham but something i I realized i was really good at doing was kind of organizing my training nutrition i was less good at was organizing like to go see family or to see friends and those things are super important to me just because they're important people to me and things to do but also for a mental health aspect i always find if i see a friend for a day it means i'm not thinking about usually all the training nutrition stuff even if we chat about it a little bit and so i found that actually making sure i book those sort of things in into my calendar like i would my training and nutrition it it helped me a lot and that always feels wrong but if i was relying on just happen chance it would never happen because i just wouldn't ever do it it's the same with like me and charlotte for holidays she's been great because she will be like man i gotta go on holiday this year like every year she wants to go on holiday for like a week at least and so if I was having it my way, I'd just be like, if I was single, I, I hate to think what I'd be doing. <laughs> I'd just feel like at home working and training all the time. So those are some of the things. And it sometimes feels really uncomfortable to do those things, but it it's so great once you do it. Even like the holidays and stuff, for me, sometimes they, they used to feel uncomfortable going and not being able to train and things. But after like two days, you're like, actually, this is great. And I feel fine. Uh, it's the same with even people who have done like not deloaded for the first time and they're like oh my god this is such a scary experience or even like a low volume phase but it goes time goes so fast and they then eventually kind of start focusing on the the positive sides to what that's bringing to them and like you then also referring back to you said like everything comes in ebbs and flows like there's times where you prioritize other things and prioritize kind of different things in your life so i've got an intro i don't know if that has brought up any thoughts but a question i definitely have to you both is if there's anything you do or you recommend people might do uh, even if you don't practice it yourself because there's definitely some things i don't practice but i might preach a little bit uh, for your own kind of mental health who wants to go first go harry all right I'll, I'll dive in um i made a real effort this last year or more like the last nine months or so to try and bring things into my life that aren't related to bodybuilding and fitness that i enjoy because I definitely found that um, up until I was probably like 24, 25, if people would be like, what, what do you enjoy? And be like, training, dieting, and a bit of what else do you enjoy? And I'd be like, dieting and training. And then I definitely got, I found that, um, I just felt like I'd be a really boring person, but it also came back to that identity thing. Like if, um, if I say stopped being a personal trainer, like what would I do? Would I just have a complete meltdown? So I'd definitely found like hobbies that I used to enjoy so things like um reading fiction and stuff like that I, I completely um like blocked fiction out of my life even though I have always been someone that absolutely loves reading books and stuff like that because I felt like it was time wasted at least at one point in my life when I was more focused on learning I felt like when I when I had time to say consume resources by consuming fiction I was wasting time and I could have been consuming Arnie's encyclopedia instead and uh yeah so I definitely brought that back into my life and then but also trying to to allow myself to do those things without feeling guilty. And what I've helped, what I found has helped me to not feel guilty when I'm say doing things that aren't related to fitness training or coaching or something like that is to do what Steve does, which is to actually schedule that time in. So like, um, you'll see, you can't really see it, but like I've got my day planned here and, uh, I actually write out the specific hours I'll be doing check-ins and the specific hours I'll be doing, say this podcast and the specific hours I'll be planning social media posts, but also the, the specific hour I'm going to be working out and then the specific hour that I'm going to be relaxing or re- hours I'm going to be relaxing as well. Because otherwise what I find happens is um, you just let the productivity stuff bleed into everything else and I'll spend the whole day doing nothing that will actually help me relax and de-stress and only things that will stress me out more. Well, not necessarily stress me out more, but um, yeah, so one, I guess going back to your question, Steve, one thing that I found helps massively is to find hobbies that are, aren't related to your current hobbies and then find a way and actually like formally structure them and plan them into your week, into your life. Is there anything else apart from reading fiction? What other hobbies? Are there any others? Uh, skateboarding? Watching yes, the Avengers? Sk- skateboarding. I really loved skateboarding when I was a teenager and I'd love to get back into it, but I have this identity crisis about that now, ironically, where I feel like I'm too old. 
to get back into it because I missed out on 10 years of it. So I think of the crew that I used to skate with, I think only one or two of them are still skating. And they're like, they're like, they'd be like comparing Mr. Olympia to um, like a newbie in the gym now in terms of this, the skill gap. But uh, yeah, I definitely miss it. But the thing is, do you know what's crazy? This is completely off topic. When I was a teenager, I'd fall over on concrete off a skateboard and just get up and carry on. When I, I tried skating and showing Hannah how to do it last summer, like I hit the ground and needed like a 10 minute recovery period. Like, whereas when I was, when I was younger, I never needed that. I would just, you know, just grab the board and try again. Whereas now I'd be sitting there, you know, like in family guy where he's like, oh, for ages. And that, and that kind of put me off of it a bit, which is ironic, like as much as I love it. But You're um, 26, yeah. aren't you, Harry? 26? Yeah, yeah. 26. We're I'm your old man. Here. I'm over the hill. Around and shed a little tear. <laughs> over the hill now. Only, only goes downhill from here, isn't that right? <laughs> How about you, Mike? I think the main things that I, I would maybe I do or that um, I'd pay, probably maybe suggest to others is just finding a bit of time to have a bit of quiet time alone just when you're in your own headspace. And I think the reason why that's so important is just to get to know yourself. And I know that sounds really kind of airy-fairy, but like it comes down to the, like you can think about things like, hang on, do I feel refreshed when I'm, by myself for a bit or do I feel a bit more refreshed when I'm with other people and then if that you know and it, it's those kinds of questions which if you start to ask yourself you just you start to get to know yourself better and then you just go down this kind of lovely journey of you know if you understand yourself better you can do what works for you and you can just gradually kind of go down a bit of a rabbit hole you know in terms of you know getting better and recovering from whatever that may be because I think we're all everybody regardless of what people say everyone is battling their own personal demons um so i think having that quiet time alone you know you know once a day or once a week i think is so important for everybody and and yeah and i would really encourage people and what i do is just try to do a little bit of personal development and again it will ebb and flow sometimes in a really manic part of your life or part of the year you might not do as much, but that's okay. But in another part, maybe, you know, when things are less busy, that's when you can really kind of nail it a little bit more. And you can think about your values, which we talked about. You can think about what really matters to me. Who am I as a person? You know, what do I like to do? What do I not like to do? And I think that's really important. And then there's other things which you can do around that, such as, you know, I think podcasts are amazing for just development. You know, some amazing podcasts out there where you can, you know, about personal development and you can listen to all those things and it's just amazing how just it makes it easy and then you can do other stuff like journaling and things but yeah just spending a bit of time alone to, to get you to know yourself i think is what i like to do cool yeah i like that i like both of those and um i like the idea of the structure there um in that i think a lot of people get kind of anxious and they feel stressed because they have so much on their plate and then they get like nothing done. I, I say that coming from experience in that mm. I just, when I have those days where I like just work bleeds into everything because I haven't sectioned off where I have things to do. Sometimes it's the busiest days where I have stuff like I have to do this at this time, this at this time, because I know if I don't structure it like that, I'm not getting it all done. And sometimes it's those days that I get the most done and I feel the best about everything. So I think that structure is great. And even structuring in some kind of quiet time to yourself to chill out, like kind of you said, Harry, in the evening, you have like your hard cut off where you don't look at work and stuff and that's something i wish i was better at sometimes i'm good at it other times i'm not i think sometimes i you probably both relate to this where you kind of accept too much work or you expect too much of yourself because you just want to be doing more always mm -hmm. so something i found to be really helpful is like one day on the weekend if i can not look at emails or and not look at kind of social media too much or barely look at it at least for like a chunk of hours that really helps me calm down because if you are if you think you work a Monday through Friday job, you probably wouldn't be checking that stuff so much. And you actually get that refreshment from the weekend. Whereas when you're self-employed or you, part of your business is social media and stuff, I don't know what it's like for you, Mike, but I imagine yours bleeds potentially into the weekends and stuff. And so you almost feel like oh, you're always doing something. But if I can have that Sunday where I don't train, which I love having that one day off where I don't kind of have anything focused on work, uh, that can be really helpful uh, for me at least. Hey, Pascal here. I just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching. And if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level, hit the link in the description below. 
Steve, one thing that I found incredibly cathartic, which you reminded me of when you said that, is uh, I delete all of my email inbox now once I've dealt with it. Apart from like, um, you know, the email chains with clients and stuff like that, like I would delete everything as soon as it's read and dealt with. And I don't know why, even if, even if it was in my inbox and it was read, so it wasn't showing up as like a new notification, but yeah, just deleting it. So when I open my emails, the little number is actually relevant to me, you know, rather than say you open your email inbox and it says like 600, I found just deleting everything. So like when I open my emails, it will just say like, say I've got three inboxes, I might say one, four and like 11. And it's just so much easier to dive into that because otherwise you end up putting off looking at your emails because you know there's like 600 unread emails even if they're mostly spam but i definitely found deleting emails is such a cathartic enjoyable process and it's what i do like between client check-ins and stuff sometimes when i need a minute to just uh, decompress from one client to start the next one i'll just be like in the inbox i delete 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 <laughs> and it's really fun it's like when you leave the things that are like almost things you don't want to do you put them off but they stay in your inbox i've got some of those emails that are like really old and i'm just like man i should have got back to this person declining or whatever maybe it's something that's just not i can, I can just think of an example someone wanted me to do some like exercise technique video recordings um, i very much doubt they're listening to this but if they are i'm sorry i haven't got back to you um because it's just like i like the idea of it i like the sound of it i was like it's just not in my kind of scope it's not of my interest i should just turn it down but i've just left it there and every day I open my emails, I'm just like, oh, that nags me. Tells you a lot about your values, your list, Just You need to get, I find ticking off things on your to-do list, do the uncomfortable things first. It's a good idea. Yeah, eat that frog. It's a really enjoyable personal development book if anyone's read it. You get the gist of it in the first first line of the first chapter, <laughs> which is do the hardest thing first. But I yeah. love that the guy just gives these examples throughout the rest of the book of people who've done the hardest thing first and had success. And you're like, yeah, I get the message now. I think it's, it's true because otherwise, yeah, it bleeds over to the next day, the next week, the next month. It, it feeds the beast, I think, a little bit in the sense that if, say, you do, like, you have to set your boundaries because if you, say, say you get a client email on a Sunday and you answer it, that expectation then is like, oh, you answer emails on a Sunday. And it's like, then that becomes an expectation and it's like a bit of a, a snowball effect. Whereas if, if you don't do that, and you don't get an answer, but you get back to them later in the week, then they go, oh, okay. You know, um, they might just subconsciously think, you know, I'll, you know, I send it on Sunday, but I know I won't get a reply. And I think that's something we, we're sometimes a bit, um, you know, we're our own worst enemy from that, that respect, I think. And it doesn't help. I'm really, really bad. bad at, yeah, I was <laughs> say, Steve. I'm really bad at sticking to my own rules. I'll tell every client I don't respond on Sundays and then they email me on a Sunday and I'll fucking respond. <laughs> And I'm the same with like social media in that, like if I can see I've got a message in my inbox, I will, and like I almost have to read it. Like it's just the fact I can see it there. So actually it was a big, I've done this, it's been for ages. I haven't had notifications for like Instagram and all the social media things. It's like Facebook Messenger and everything. I don't, the only thing I get notifications for is emails and WhatsApp, which is basically typically just work stuff or friends. But yeah, social media, like... If I check that in the evening, I, I even know the other night I checked and there was someone posted and basically were calling me all sorts of names and calling me an idiot on one of my posts. And it just triggered me. And I was like, why is this? I, I get triggered like that really easy. I think Pascal's great at just ignoring those sort of comments because they're like, they're an idiot. It and I know, bother me at all. I know it's, yeah, it bothers me so much. I don't know why to my core. So, so with stuff like that, I know I had to get back to him with like a really like good response, whatever. Otherwise, it was just playing on my mind the whole evening. Steve, and that, I have to get back to them. <laughs> that that isn't the right like response for me it's to actually not read stuff past a certain time um because yeah that that bleeds into sleep that probably bleeds into mental health um and how you feel and everything so yeah i think one final thing as well is something that's helped me recently a little bit is trying to really be kind and maybe think of others and the reason why i say that is because Sometimes, again, we might send someone a message and they don't get back to us maybe when we think they might. And we immediately think, oh, what are they doing? And, you know, I've been waiting all this time and stuff. But if we are curious about the other person, we can say, oh, their, their pet could be ill or they could be, you know, really busy right now. And I think if we're sort of, you know, try to be curious and, and appreciate that they're, you know, really busy, I think that sometimes takes a bit of mental load off us because we'd like to think maybe other people are doing the same thing and we don't put the pressure on ourselves to try and get back to others, you know, straight away. 
when it's not possible. Yeah, I like that. You, you're talking about Harry, aren't you? Because <laughs> he took ages to reply to our, our WhatsApp group. <laughs> my, my my friends and family know what I'm like now because uh, I think this is um, years of the in-gym personal training has done this to me because if I have eight clients back-to-back or six clients back-to-back, that's six hours straight. I can't do anything other than focus on the person in front of me. So my family have all got in the habit now of only messaging me like late in the evening because they know that's when I'll actually be looking at my phone. Otherwise, what happens is I see the message at like 2 p.m., but I can't mentally deal with it until later on in the day when I actually have some time free and then by that point i've totally forgotten that the message is even there so most of my friends and family will resend messages in the evening which is probably the best way to get hold of me if you need me mike and steve (laughs) but that's okay because again you're training the beast and i think that's where sometimes automatic (laughs) replies can be really helpful because if you have if someone sends an email and they get an automatic reply back then immediately that person's like oh you know so and so works you know with um, you know, in-person clients from eight to eight, Monday to Wednesday. I know not to expect a reply till Thursday. And it's all good. No, there's me living in 2020, and Mike's living in 2050. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I reckon someone who's good at this sort of thing is Andy Morgan. I think he's yeah. he's probably spoken about it, even maybe on one of the early podcasts we did, where he's quite good at protecting his time, and that's something actually Pascal really introduced to me, and I need to be better at um, with kind of protecting my time in that. Pascal's great at that. Yeah, Sometimes you message Pascal and asking him something and he just says, I will deal with this in two days. And you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's great. It's great. It is good because I think also what you do in that scenario is because I've had it where I've had emails and I, I read it and I'm like, I can't respond to this now. Why am I reading it? And then it's on my mind. I'm like, I should, if I read it, just reply to him and say, I'm going to get back to you. I don't know when I, when I can or whatever it is in that time, because then you offload it in your mind, but also for them, you've kind of calmed them down in a sense you they, they don't chase you being like oh have you have you received this whatever and i think you can do that with not just work but like friends family whatever it is i think that's a, actually a really good strategy is there anything the only other thing i've tried i personally am quite an anxious person uh, which i think i've said before and i do supplement with ashwagandha now and then which i don't know what it's doing exactly i haven't necessarily felt an effect from it um, I mostly take it during when I feel like days I feel stressed or in like overreaching weeks, I typically do dose it up, uh, which hopefully is doing something to help. Wouldn't actually... you want the extra um, stimulation though for the overreaching week or is it a bit the... too much sometimes? Yeah, the ashwagandha, I don't think it's kind of acting on um, like the roles for hypertrophy. I think it's more so acting on like stress, anxiety, so things that potentially... Uh, impact systemic fatigue but not in a positive way for hypertrophy mm-hmm. i'd expect but it's a good question um i don't think it would probably kind of counteract anything if it does now i'm stressing even more um no i don't think i don't think it would um and then the only other thing i have tried and i did it for a little bit and i got really out of the habit i think it's probably something i need to do more of is kind of that kind of guided meditation i've done those before but i'm one of the, like like you were saying harry you feel like you always have to be productive and it kind of feels like one of those things that's a waste of time Um, which I know it's not, and it's actually evidence-based, like meditation and everything, but I struggle to be consistent with that. Probably something if you made it a habit and you did it every evening, you'd be able to work it into your day quite comfortably, but I I haven't been able to. What I would say, based on the consistent values analysis I've given myself, is if there's a thing I'm consistently trying to make a habit and it doesn't happen, then that tells me that I don't value that thing and that my effort would be better spent trying to do something else. So in the instance where, say, you really struggle to build meditation in and have done forever, maybe that form of meditation just isn't suitable for you. Like I've identified that I don't like formal meditation, but I find things like listening to an audiobook or a podcast or something like that, provided I don't do anything else, is meditation for me. And uh, and like hopping on Call of Duty with my brother is a bit of meditation as well, because I can't think about anything other than just the, us chatting to each other. And that's really nice, because otherwise I find that while I'm meditating, I'm thinking about something other than the meditation which is defeating the point of meditation in the first place it's not though because i think that's the common misconception about meditation okay. that that's my misconception it's, your thought, but it's about letting the thoughts come and go um so yeah don't 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 worry that's okay sometimes it's actually hard i remember because the guided meditation it takes you through all of that where you're like I can't remember it because I did it like a year ago. Um, but yeah, I remember it taking you through like, so let your thoughts just go. And I'm like, 
no, I need to focus on something. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually hard. Um, that's something I would like to do. But I do do similar, like going for walks, listening to audiobooks, listening to podcasts. And actually, I guess I let that happen because when I listen to audiobooks, I hate myself for it, but I end up switching off completely to the audiobook <laughs> uh, for like sections and I have to go back. But that's probably quite cathartic in its own right. What I found really useful is throw in some audiobooks and podcasts that you wouldn't normally listen to. Like things that peak you, you know, if you've ever been in a bookshop, probably not for the last decade because they're dying out now, but sometimes you'd see a book cover that piques your interest straight away and you'd be drawn to it. I'd like to do that with podcasts and stuff as well, rather than only listening to things that I would normally listen to. And one thing I found that I absolutely love is listening to uh, like comedy podcasts and stuff that have nothing to do with fitness. And I find just laughing is such a cathartic yeah. thing to do. And sometimes I might not have the time to sit down and say, watch like a comedy or something like that, but listen to podcasts that are really funny. Just, I love that. Like there's one I listen to with um, Matt from Busted and it's really funny. I can't remember what it's called, but um, they basically just interview celebrities and ask them what their biggest, um, uh, what do they call that? Basically the things that they do that they don't let anyone else know about, the things that they're most ashamed of. <laughs> like, you know, like some people, one person, I think it was Emma Willis, like Matt's wife said that she never cleans her feet in the shower. And it's just really funny. You just <laughs> hear these random things that people do that they're ashamed of. And then they rate it based on whether it's a good, bad or a bad, bad. Like oh, one guy that. said he always, he always eats his kid's cereal and they're like, that's a bad, bad. And then like <laughs> stuff, do you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. And it is hilarious and only like 20 minutes long, but you spend the whole time laughing and they're really good. I think that's probably something I do a little bit of, like the switching off, like trash TV. Uh, me and yeah. Charlotte love trash TV, and most evenings we will watch something really trashy that you can just like laugh at or switch off to that just means nothing. It's just there to serve the purpose of just kind of calming you down and chilling you out. I think laughing is so important, so important. And um, like I know sometimes I've like asked, me, I've kind of thought to myself, hang on, when was the last time I've had a like a full on belly laugh, like stitch, like my head, my face hurts because I've been smiling so hard. Um, and yeah, I think it's so important. And I think sometimes like a lot of us just, we just don't like have a laugh. And we, yeah, we just need yeah. to keep it simple. I'm definitely quite a serious person. I've been told that a number of times. I don't know if I you guys are the same. <laughs> the PTs I work with call me boring. <laughs> because apparently like I don't I don't react and I don't share anything and then whenever say oh like like if they meet me outside of the gym they say, always say I'm a completely different person they say like it's if we're around like someone's flat or something for like drinks or something like that everyone is always amazed at how much I speak because when I'm at work I just feel like I'm in work mode I don't have time to deal with anything except the task in front of me so I'm really uh, boring in that sense <clears throat> I was what was I going to say yeah the last time I remember having that extreme laughter was literally the last improvement season with Pascal where I cried laughing laughing and that was where he was describing when he ate like the protein fluff and had to call an ambulance to, <laughs> to like see if something was wrong um so yeah that's what, something was, was just, wrong with his digestive system yeah, yeah, I, yeah I think he thought something was seriously wrong <laughs> so that's yeah, hilarious bloating mine was probably when Pascal was talking about the, you know, the weighted vest experiment that, um, uh, oh, I can't weighted remember his name. <laughs> yeah. The weighted West. And I just couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. Yeah. <laughs> He'd never live it down. We just laugh yeah. at Pascal. He's great comedy value. <laughs> yes. Like he had, he had his most recent vlog was on, he had exploding butter. He tried to make a brownie for, um, for Kate and it just exploded. And he was like, Fuck, exploding butter. <laughs> like, I didn't know butter could explode and it's just like everywhere. Oh, I was, so, I was in stitches. It was so funny. But that's a that really good point, said, I think. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Harry. I oh, know, I was going to say, going back to the things I do outside of uh, fitness, I made a real effort to go and see more stand up comedy over the last couple of years because. I think it's one of the best things you can do. And it's a real shame that lots of venues and stuff are closed down now, but um, yeah. definitely recommend the comedy store in Leicester square because you can show up on the door and there's always a bunch of people there. And it's such a small environment that you will not, you are not safe if you sit in the front two rows, but sometimes that's so nice. If you deliberately put yourself there, just knowing someone's going to rip you to pieces is, it is absolutely hilarious. And it's my favorite thing ever to do. <laughs> I'm terrible yeah. for that. Cause like I never have any com comebacks when someone rips into you. I'm right. just like, I'm but, okay. <laughs> it's like, I'm you're not some, that I'm person thinking. is so gifted at shredding. You're never going to come up with a good comeback anyway. <laughs> they do it every night of the week, don't they? So that's what makes it even funnier. Cause, and if you try and come back, people, it just ridicules you more. So it's just better to just sit there and take it. Take it. 
just smile <laughs> take it all um cool so we're, we're pretty much at an hour actually and i think that was pretty it was actually very interesting to me something i know i need to do is laugh more so i might have to see some more comedy sketches because that's really great um and also i think we started off talking about a lot of the like comparison is the thief of joy type of things and realistic expectations is super important and understanding your values i think those were some massive takeaways i don't know if there's anything you guys want to kind of close on for mental health body dysmorphia mike uh, mike's yeah. got some great critical thinking analyses i like He's gonna come out with five points i know yeah <laughs> I think like you, you summarized it really well. Um, I think the main things would be, yeah, knowing, spending some time alone so that you can kind of identify, you know, what is your definition of success? What are your values? Um, being kind to yourself, because I think we are our own worst critic. And would we be saying those things if it was our mum or if it was our brother or if it was our partner? I think those are really important. And that always makes me feel ashamed when I do that. Sorry, Mark, when I do the exercise, when I say, would I talk to someone I love the way I talk to myself? And then you feel that little bit of shame at how horrible you are to yourself sometimes. It's like, mum, you don't have shredded glutes. You're so like <laughs> fat or whatever. It's like, we'd never say that to like our mums or whatever. So why do we say it to ourselves? Even a, a client mm. is a great one. When I think about that, like stuff like that, I've never said. Yeah. So I think Would I call a client a piece of shit if they didn't finish their workout? No. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I you think like, <laughs> so I think those would be the main things, and yeah, I think laughter ca cannot be underestimated. I like where this podcast has gone because I've forgotten how much I love the stand-up comedy, mm. and it's. Yeah, it's seeing it live is just so good, especially if you let yourself. I know, Steve, you probably won't, but if you let yourself have an alcoholic drink first, it makes it so much better. Just one, because it, it reduces. I get a bit of like crowd and social MPS. anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's all I have. I was thinking what, MPS in the context of comedy. Does that mean anything? <laughs> but no, like I get a little bit of like, um, because I'm very much like you, like work so solitary all the time. I get a little bit of like social anxiety, just about being in big places with lots of people. And that takes the edge off, which helps you just focus on the comedy so much more. Cool. And you'd laugh your absolute ass off. We should all do it as a team thing. I was going to say, we need a Team Revive Stronger trip, I think. <laughs> awesome. Guys, thank you so much for this chat. Um, hopefully, people have taken away some nuggets from this and enjoyed it. The coaching corner seems to go down super well. So I want to say thank you both to Mike and Harry for kind of doing this with me. Um, and thank everyone for listening. Um, yeah, let us know your mental health tips or kind of worries um it's always great i think the more people can talk about this sort of thing the better so yeah thank you for tuning in we'll catch up with you soon thanks guys. thanks for having us So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're going to have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're going to go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're going to be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.